one thing you should know about living in a 500 unit apartment complex, it is that once you leave your apartment, an interaction is inevitable. One day, my mom and I were on our way to the market when the elevator stopped and opened to let in our neighbor, Iakeji. Iakeji and my mom exchanged the usual greetings, and then Iakeji proceeds to say to my mom, Ah! Shade! Hmm! This your daughter, eh? She's a very good girl, oh! Ah! Ah! Every Sunday, I see her in that laundry room, folding the clothes, separating the clothes, ah! Uh ah! -uh. I wish my sons were like her. They don't even know how to do anything. I look at my mom and the smile on her face does something to my inner being. It felt as if I just received the bolus dose of all the confidence and self-esteem I needed to conquer the world. All the Miss Sunday Night movie premieres on Disney Channel were so worth it in that moment. I thought I am the biggest, baddest, most sought after laundry doer in this entire building. Y'all, I was 11. <laughs> I was 11 years old. At that moment, my need for validation was born. And to obtain my daily prescription of praise, I would adhere to unusual standards and expectations that were not entirely instrumental to my development. Now, this is gonna sound a bit bizarre, but what if I told you that after many and many years of learning inside and outside the classroom setting, it is finally time for you to unlearn some things. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the art of unlearning and the several ways the art has taken shape in my life. At the conclusion, you'll receive a five-step blueprint on how to master the art of unlearning. So stay with me. My name is Morgan Ogunle. I was born and raised in Uptown Chicago, and I'm a first-generation Nigerian-American. In my household, I am the first-born child, and that alone carries a lot of significance. In Nigerian culture, the firstborn is the crown of your head, hence my second name, Omolade, which translates to child is a crown. The firstborn is the beginning of your legacy, the owner of your inheritance, the symbol of your potency, and the second parent. I'll get to that in just a bit. From a young age, I knew something was different about my upbringing. I have what is called the hybrid experience. While I was born in the United States, I am deeply rooted in Nigerian customs, traditions, and beliefs. As I attempted to mend the bridge between both of my identities, I was faced with several contradicting notions. What made things more difficult was the fact that I was not gifted a template or handed a guide on how to present and represent and functionally exist in my being. Imagine being expected to follow a blueprint that is still being developed. The pressure of getting things right when I didn't even know what right looked like. After an enlightening conversation with my aunt, who is also my cousin, I was able to pinpoint where much of my unlearning ultimately took place. First, we have the starved self-esteem and the desperate need for validation, an actual recipe for disaster. Add this phrase to your vocabulary, bush girl. A bush girl is straight from the boondocks. She lacks home training. She talks too much. She laughs too loud. She asks too many questions. She's a bit too forward and is what Americans would call assertive. She's off-putting in the sense that she's outgoing, but with everyone. Being the social bee that I am, this is something I was almost forced to silence in my personality to avoid being labeled as a bush girl. While I loved conversation and inherited my father's booming laughter, and I liked to make my stance known, this was not something an exemplary firstborn Nigerian daughter was to do. After a while of hearing do this and do that and this way and that way and now or never, my mind sort of morphed. And while the expectations were being met, the success in doing so was driven by my need for validation from anyone about anything, all at the expense of my self-esteem. <laughs> Little Mommy Morgan is what they called me and I loved it. I did it well too. I'd do my homework in class so I could help my sister with her so my mom wouldn't have to. I'd keep fractions of birthday and Christmas money just in case there was no money for gas one day. I learned to change, feed, and burp a baby before I knew how to ride a bike or, or swim. In fact, I still don't. But here's the thing. Little Mommy Morgan didn't realize when the second parent identity began to overshadow the existing, more relevant, big sister title. I am still in learning that discipline is mine to execute. 
a few more terms to grasp here. Allow me to familiarize you with the infamous ma and sa. Picture this, it's the first day of third grade, and upon entering the classroom with my mom walking right behind me, I crouch to the ground a foot away from my teacher and I say, good morning, ma. Ma is for women and sa is for men. So I thought, perfect, nailed it. Right foot in front of left, bow, greet. Now to my surprise, not only was Miss Owens taken aback, but so were the 15 other students whose faces said, girl, what was that? <laughs> Not exactly the reaction I was looking for. Now fast forward to the seventh grade when I received a phone call home from my English teacher reporting me for being outwardly disrespectful by refusing to make eye contact during redirection. Here's the thing, eye contact in my household is the ultimate sign of disrespect. It's the equivalent to saying, it's on less tussle, whereas outside my home, it implies confidence and asserts credibility. Respect and mannerisms was something I had to learn, unlearn, and relearn in a way that was conducive to both cultures but settled right with me, which resulted in the unconscious development of what I call two-facedism, which is also known as code switching. In the household, I was picture perfect, but around my homegirls, not so much. The balance didn't exist because the standard was in place and I felt the need to live up to it. Now, for the sake of time, in the next few moments, I'm going to hand you a five-point blueprint that I developed on how to unlearn whatever it is you wish to dismantle, whether it be a product of your childhood, a past romantic relationship, a present job placement, a Hulu commercial. You get the gist. Presenting to you, I, Bo. This is not, in fact, a factual statement. I do require bumpers and a personal chair team to do anything remarkable in a game of bowling. But this, this right here is a recipe on how to unlearn whatever it is you wish to unlearn. First, identify. B, believe. O, own. W, walk. And L, live. First, identify. Identify the notion that no longer serves you, or perhaps it never served you to begin with, but because you knew nothing different and thought, hmm, this must be the way. This must be right. Maybe I just need to hop on board and get with the program. No. What you need to do is get off at the next bus stop and follow a new route. Here's the thing. Familiarity kills discovery, and oftentimes it is the comfort of the familiar that keeps one from attaining the treasures of the next level and prolongs the exodus into the next chapter of your novel. After all, to discover new land, you have to lose sight of shore. Second, believe. Believe and own the fact that said notion is no longer conducive to the person you are right now and the person you envision yourself to be in the next month or in the next year or in the next decade. It is also important that you forgive it, forgive them, and most importantly, forgive yourself for allowing it to hinder the person you were. The most important physical relationship you're going to have is between you and yourself. So beating yourself up for missed opportunities or wasted time will only leave you beat. At this point, you've done the easy part. You've called it by name and you've put it in its place. Now third, own it. Here's where the internal battle may start. You've called it by name and you've put it in its place, but all that starts in here. When you own something, that becomes visible to the public. Owning something implies a full sense of control over it. It means you're responsible for the damages and the judgment. I once heard, words without actions are just syllables, and actions without words are like a door that leads to nothing. So fourth, walk. Walk in it. With your head up high and your chin to the sky, walk the walk. Sure, you may roll an ankle here and there, but refuse the old chapter seeking to be read once more and embrace the change that accompanies unlearning. And don't lose sight of the certitude that the battle is won. It's a practice, and no matter how cheesy this may sound, practice does make perfect. And finally, live. Live in your new. At this point, it's become a lifestyle. That new mindset and perspective is engraved into the person you are, and it feels good. It feels like growth and new beginnings and fulfillment. The beautiful part about this stage is that it can be shared just like in the classroom or during a job orientation when information is relayed for understanding, so can the exodus from old lessons be shared for enlightenment. Conformity cancels uniqueness, and difference is inspiring. 
So perhaps your new mindset can benefit someone else. So I leave you with this. The mind cannot resist the temptation to believe what is regularly repeated. What is that mindset, that notion, that expectation, that, that, that perspective that no longer feels right, but because it feels familiar, you keep hanging on. 11-year-old Morgan on that elevator needed to know that the praise was temporary and times would eventually call for her to be the author of her own validation. So call it out. Point it out. Embrace that development and grow forward. I hope that one day you will partake in the art of unlearning and bow with me. Thank you. Yeah.